Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, the Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And before we talk today's young entrepreneurial guest, whom is going to tell us how to launch and live the right way, I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co host. You know him, you love him, Six Sigma, Scott Todd from scotttodd.net, landmodo.com, and most importantly, you're not automating your Craigslist and your Facebook postings, postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Scott Todd, how are you? M- Mark, I'm, I'm great. Uh, I'm kind of scratching my head about this podcast, but you know, I'm looking forward to seeing where it goes because I think we were just both taken, taken back with like what I'm going to call the ugly site, an ugly site, but it converts. It converts. It converts. So I, I want to hear more about this. I, I'm excited to, to hear more about this. I, I, I do want to just let everybody know that today's podcast is sponsored by postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Because Scott Todd, we can always make more money. We can't get more time. Automate it and get out. I mean, look, I get 124 ads out of the click of a button. It's not bad. Not bad. Not it's bad. Not bad. So... Our guest is young and a young hustler, Travis Marziani. And I got, a pod, I got a podcast. I got an email from Travis, cold email. I think I have a story your audience would love and that we could have a lot of fun on a podcast. Four years ago, Travis quit his corporate job to start a successful online business and travel the world. Since then, he started his own podcasts. How to Do Your 20s and Build My Online Store, an e-commerce YouTube channel, and he's currently launching a Kickstarter for his new company, Performance Nut Butter, geared towards people looking to eat vegan. You know, David Benalis is vegan, paleo, keto, or generally healthier on the go. And that would be me because I want to be healthier. Scott Todd's living at Panera eating bread, but not me. I haven't been to Panera Bread in weeks, man. Weeks. In weeks. What, what, what about the breakfast place? Uh, first watch. Haven't been there once in the last month. All right. Well, let's get Travis Marziani's take. <laughs> Travis, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me on. So let's rewind the tape a bit. How does Travis Marziani escape corporate America and start his own successful online business and then travel the world? So I'll, I probably have a little bit more unique of a story than uh, a lot of the listeners are able to do because I was, I was young. Uh, I mean, I'm still young, but when I quit my job, I didn't have a family. I didn't have anything like that. I got a really good consulting job out of college making what was to me a lot of money considering the fact that, you know, I didn't have a family. I didn't have a house to pay for. I didn't have any land to pay for. So I ended up just quitting cold Turkey cause I was, uh, I mean, I hate to use the word depressed, but I was depressed. I hated this grind. I felt like, and I explained to my boss when I quit, I felt like I was a tiger trapped in a cage because I had all these, you know, ideas and all the stuff I wanted to do, but I got paid a salary and doesn't matter how hard I worked, I wouldn't make much more. So I quit my job cold Turkey to start a dance clothing business, which I'm not a dancer. It just ended up being, it was a very profitable niche. And I knew that dance moms were willing to spend a lot of money on their, on their little girl who they're spending thousands of dollars on dance lessons. They don't want to go to Walmart to buy a pair of shorts. So I started that business. And the other thing, the reason why I started that was the repeat customers. I knew that you don't just buy dance pants once you need to buy a new costume every few months. And the cool thing about that was it was very scalable. So it was at first, it was just me and my mom who had no, knew how to sew dance clothing and so she, if we got one order a week, she'd make it. Then as we scaled up, you know, we started getting 10 orders a day. We hired someone to do the cutting. Then we started getting 20 orders a day. We hired someone to do cutting and shipping. And then before you know it now, it's still not a huge team, but it's a team of about 15 people. My mom doesn't do any of the cutting, any of the sewing. And so from there, my love of e-commerce has grown. You know, Scott Todd, being the father of a 12-year-old dancer, uh, Travis is like, I'm like his ideal customer. I went, I like my wife's like, okay, go get, uh, Ella, you know, some dance clothes. We went to the store in Scottsdale and literally it, they, they could be like, okay, it's a thousand dollars. I'm like, Oh, 
Okay. Like I would even know. <laughs> like I'm not shopping it. I'm not looking for it on Amazon. I'm like, this is the dance store. Whatever my little girl wants, that's fine. Right. And whatever, wherever you, you go where your wife told you to go too. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, well, I actually, I went where the dance company told me to go. Oh, there you it, go. You know, yeah. So, so I, I mean, like, how do you, uh, okay. I, I've got a ton of questions, right? But like, um, so, so like today you, you actually manufacture everything or is it, is it manufactured by another company and then you're just selling it? It's, it's currently all manufactured by us. That is something we're looking at doing, but the, there's a lot of issues with having someone else manufacture it, mostly which they want to charge you way more than uh, it would cost us to make it ourselves. So we have employees that cut, sew, uh, do the threads, shipping, every little detail is handled in-house. And like the, I think that one of the, the waves that I see a lot today, and I mean, because you, I mean, you're, you're an expert in e-commerce space, right? One of, the, one of the things I see a lot today, and I see it floating around Facebook, and I see it everywhere is, Oh man, you want to be in e-commerce? Just just go and find find a niche, find products on AliExpress. Just throw it on your website, you know. And to me, it seems like everybody's hustling the same. I'm going to be harsh here. The same junk, right? Like right. you know, like there's no there's no different. Like in your site, I see something that's different. Then I mean I just jumped on AliExpress and I, I can't find products that are like your quality or anything on, on there. So if I'm starting on e-commerce, how do I get going? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. I think that's a mistake a lot of people want to make is they want to do the drop shipping or they want to do something uh, very simple to get into. And the simpler simpler it is to get into, the simpler it is to reproduce. So to answer that question, actually I, I think a good way of explaining it is this first business our employees, like our family would say, oh, aren't you afraid that one of your employees is going to go steal the idea and copy it? And I'm like, no, because the amount of work it takes to manufacture and the amount of work it takes to do the online marketing, I, I, it takes a quality team. Like me and my mom are very lucky to do it. And then the same thing with this new business that I'm launching, the performance nut butter business, it's not impossible for someone to copy, but the amount of time it's taken to get the product to taste good and find the manufacturer and do all this kind of stuff. It's not by any means impossible for someone to come in and copy exactly my product and redo it, but it's going to take some work. And I think anybody that is, what's the right word, not intelligent enough to come up with their own idea and tries to copy my idea. I think I'd be able to beat them out at the marketing. So if someone does performance nut butter version 2.0 and it's their own company, I'm like, great. They're, they're not competition to me. So it comes down to a lot of things. I think if you're looking for an idea for an e-commerce company, one, obviously, and this is the stereotypical thing is what are you interested in? That's performance nut butter for me. It's like, oh, I was interested in health, nutrition. I'm in interested in athletics. Now, the other way of looking at it, and this might be even more interesting to your audience is find somebody else that has a passion and maybe you know how to market. Like I know how to do marketing. I know how to build websites. I know how to do all this stuff. I don't care about dance clothing. I, I really don't, but my mom did. So I'm like, okay, this is a perfect team because when we hit some kind of a, a hurdle, either I can tackle it usually or she can tackle it. If it's a design question, I have no idea. That's 100% her. So I don't know if that answers your question a little bit. No, I, I, it, it does. I think that the, um, I, I mean, it sounds like really what you need to do is really think through what, what you want that store to be or what that e-commerce space is going to be. And then like maybe even source, you know, your own products as opposed to just jumping on the AliExpress bandwagon. And another thing is just a quick side note. I'd say niche down as hard as you can. That's a huge mistake. I see so many companies wanting to do is they want to be uh, like Amazon. I'm like, you can't, you, you don't have the money to be like Amazon. Don't sell anything. If you, you know, you, you were talking about B dance where looking really ugly and it does, but for a dance mom, that's a very, it's her, it's for her. It's hundred percent for her performance, not butter. It doesn't have the site yet, but if you look at the optics, you look at the logo, you look at all that kind of stuff, it's 100% for the CrossFit person, the paleo person. It almost looks like a supplement, even though it's natural food. So I'm not, I'm not trying to target that towards the mom and her kids. It's, I'm very binary. And that's another mistake people make because they want to be for everybody. It's like, no, no, no. Be as binary as possible. Yeah. No, it's, that, that is really good advice. Um, I, I'd want to know that, you know, why, let's say when you're launching 
any e-commerce site, right? But like, let's just take performance nut butter. Why Kickstarter? Why not go to a squeeze page, drive traffic to it through Facebook ads and start pre-selling that way? Like why Kickstarter? Why Indiegogo? Why do it that way? Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't, I'm not saying this is the only way to do it by any means, but uh, I did a lot of research on the different ways to do it. And so Kickstarter, one of the benefits and a very small one is they have a built-in marketplace and it's also, it doesn't seem like a scam. I think another thing is when people are buying something online, they're very hesitant. I'm an unknown brand at this point. Performance Nut Butter, nobody knows about. If I send you from Facebook to some squeeze page saying, hey, support us now and in a month or two, I'm gonna send you a product, Ugh, I would never pull that trigger. But once it's on Kickstarter and I, you know, I spent, it's not an insane amount, but I spent $3,400 on a video and I'm, I'm trying to make all this stuff look as professional as possible. And by having it on Kickstarter as well, it's like one more tick and this person isn't trying, trying just to steal my credit card. I like it. Scott, Todd, what are your thoughts? I, I think, uh, you, know, you know, I think that Kickstarter is kind of like this, this scary place, right? You know, like I, I think it's a great place to go launch a product. Like you're saying, it's not, I mean, you know, you're, you've invested money and time into building this campaign. Um, you know, I, 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 I think that there's a lot of potential that Kickstarter could be used for that I don't think people are necessarily thinking about, uh, especially to bring new products to market. I think it's a phenomenal place to, to bring a new mark, uh, product to market because you're, you're getting the crowd to help you in the development and to get some of those costs under wraps. Yeah, I mean, one of, one of my favorite books is Tiny Bets. Yeah. And this is a tiny bet, mm -hmm. right? Because if what he'll find definitively, he'll know definitively through this Kickstarter campaign, whether or not he has a market or not. Right. One thing actually uh, I want to add to the reason I did Kickstarter versus a squeeze page is there's an end date. So at the end of 30 days, like if I did a squeeze page, it's like, Hey guys, uh, it'll be over in 30 days, but it's a little squishy when I say, okay, I got a Kickstarter. It's 30 days. And I reach out to a blogger and say, Hey, do you want to do a piece on performance? Not butter they're either going to say yes or no, uh, but they're more likely to say yes because of the 30 days incentive where if I send out the same article about B-Dance or, hey, do you want to do an article about us? It's like, yeah, sure. Maybe in the next month or two. It's like, no, 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 no. It, it, there's a deadline. And some people won't like that. Some people don't like the, the deadline, but because it's not a quote unquote artificial deadline set by me, it's a deadline that is mandatory by Kickstarter. That's another reason why I did it. There's um, a book called, I think it's called Launch. It's all about how to launch a product and the, the whole email sequence. People need that incentive of it's going to be over in 30 days. And that's why you always see those countdown timers of sale ends in one hour or two days. So that was another reason why I did it. Yeah, no, it, it totally makes a lot of sense. This uh, Jeff Walker, right? Launch. Yep. yep, yep. So what, what, lessons have you learned about launching a Kickstarter campaign, creating a product, analyzing a market, and, 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 and starting an e-commerce company? So I'll start, since I've been talking about a lot of positives I've done, I'll talk about a mistake I made. And, you know, it's a little too late to fix this, but you talked about tiny bets and I am a huge fan of that. Even this, the idea of this was to do a small bet, but it's probably bigger than I probably should have done. I probably should have started selling small little jars to my gym and really getting feedback. Instead, I kind of took a leap of faith and I, I did do a lot of testing and I got a lot of people that said, I really like this product, but you know what? Not too many people gave me money. I, I got a little bit of money here and there for some people, but I should have probably done it earlier on selling the jars until I made some money. I was antsy. Um, I was kind of sick of selling dance clothing and I wanted to do something else in the e-commerce space. So that's a big mistake I made. A big positive though is I, I'll, I'll talk about the, the whole, or a big part of the funnel was on Instagram, I was doing basically getting email capture. So I would promote on my Instagram and say, hey, if you want to win a free early bird jar, like a beta testing jar, sign up here. Now, most people stop there. They get the email and they're like, that's cool. What I did is I set up an automatic thing to send them an email that seemed pretty personalized. And I really did mean it from a personalized point of view where I asked them, you know, what do you do for fun? So I asked them a question in a good percentage, I'd say 20 to 25% probably of those people responded and say, hey, Travis, I really like your product. 
I, you know, do CrossFit for fun or I'm a mom and I do cycling for fun. On top of that, the next step I did was I started a Facebook launch group, a pre-launch group. And in there, it's not a huge group at this point. It's almost 500 people, but those 500 people are really excited for my product. So it's not just like I have a bunch of emails. I have a group of people that I can see their face. They can see my face and I give them updates constantly. I'm saying, all right, well, this week I sent out a bunch of jars to influencers. This week I went and visited my manufacturer and I asked them questions. I say, hey, do you guys like this logo or this logo better? And they feel invested in Every day I've, I'm getting multiple people in the group saying, oh, I can't wait. It's only four days away. And that just doesn't happen with a pure email list. So the Facebook group has been huge for me. Uh, yeah. I mean, Scott, you're shaking your head. Well, you're on mute, Scott. Hold on. There you go. There we go. I'm sorry. Um, I think that the, the thing of, the, the thing that uh, a lot of companies are now doing is, you know, they're, they're building their brand on their personal page and then they're, subsidizing that with a Facebook group because, you know, there, there's benefits of being in that group and you can get more interaction. I just saw that um, on Facebook Live, you can you can do a Facebook Live and share from your business page to like your business group. So you have constant branding, um, you know, so it's not, so you're bringing new people in who like your company into your company brand. At the same time, you're able to send, send that same message out to that group, that more loyal following. And it's amazing what you can do with just, you know, what's the number? They say like, if you have a, a thousand loyal customers, a thousand raving fans, it's all you need. I mean, you're halfway there. Yep. Kevin Kelly, a thousand true fans, a hundred percent. That the idea, right. Being if they each are willing to give you $50 a year, just $50 a year, that's $50,000. Or if they're each willing to give you a hundred dollars a year, a hundred thousand dollars. I'm, I'm a huge fan of that. I think one other actual tip I've gotten from this is, uh, and this could be for your listeners. Obviously, you guys have already done it, but starting a podcast for me has been huge. So I have How to Do Your 20s. I started three years ago. And the reason I started that was just because I knew no matter what my interests were, I'd always be able to relate it to your 20s up until I, you know, I turned 30. But it, it was general enough that I could interview anybody. I could bring anybody on the podcast. And it's been crucial for the launch, uh, for the launch of Performance Nut Butter because I've interviewed about 40 to 50 influential people in the health and fitness space. Well, at the end of the interview, I get to tell them about my product and I get to say, hey, do you mind if I send you a free jar? And if I reach out to somebody cold email and say, can I send you a free jar? They're going to be like, hell no. I don't know who you are. You're going to be sending me a jar of weird stuff. But if I just had an hour long conversation all about them and then I ask, it's, it's a lot uh, harder to say no. And it's a lot more easy for them to wrap their mind around getting a jar of food from someone. So having that platform for me has been huge, not just you know, developing an audience, but 100% for connecting with interesting people. And that's a big reason why I started it. So tell us a little bit about your travels and, and how do you do your 20s? I, in the, the point of the podcast is not that I have the answer. It's that I'm asking the question constantly. Um, I will say some of the, there's a lot of answers you get over and over again. One of the big ones, and I think this is most of the answers I get are true. I think at any age, it's stuff like, uh, be careful, you know, who you listen, listen to yourself more than you listen to society. And that's a, a thing that I think my generation is becoming a little bit better at is saying, wait a minute, I don't know if I trust you guys. I don't know if I trust that the corporate world is the best answer for me. I'm going to take a step back. So I, I think it's just being really honest with yourself. And one lesson that's personally helped me a lot is taking a few hours each week away from everybody just to kind of reflect on the week. And then, you know, I take a few, a day or two uh, every few months and reflect on the last few months. And then a few days every year and say, okay, how was last year? What did I like about it? What did I not? Most people, my assumption is, including me up until recently, don't ever do this. They just live second to second, moment by moment and don't say, wait a minute, am I actually going where I want to go? So I think it's being brutally honest with yourself and saying, wait, is this what I want to do? Or is this what my, and, and for someone in their twenties, is this what my parents want me to do? Or is, you know, it could be, is this what my girlfriend, wife, or whoever wants me to do? I, th I think that's one of the big lessons I've learned. Scott, when you were in your 20s, did you have any idea what you wanted to do? Um, 
Okay. So when I was in my twenties, I, I knew I wanted, I wanted freedom. I, I knew I wanted what I had now have now, and I didn't know how to get there. Right. Mark, you, you and I, um, you know, you're, when you tell your stories of like you, your desire to, to be free of your corporate job and, and everything, man, I, I can so relate to that. In fact, you know, you, you went out and you made it happen while I, I stayed in the corporate job and, and worked up until, as you know, like last year. So, you know, like, um, I, I think that, I think that you, you kind of have this vision of what you want. Okay. But I don't think that, um, I think it takes a lot of nerve to go get it. Okay. Because in your twenties, especially as you, you get to your later twenties, man, you're starting to, to, you're starting to talk about getting married. Okay. You've probably been dating for someone for a while. You're starting to talk about getting married. Kids are on the horizon. Okay. And you know, it's, it's, it's reckless, right? Like, I mean, that's what your wife said to you. You can't quit your job. We have a newborn. So it's, it's reckless behavior to go do that. And so I think that that's kind of like, you know, I call it like the Mr. Holland Opus syndrome, you know, like here's a guy, he had this, this vision of being a musician, but then life got in the way. And, you know, he, he spends his entire career as a musician, um, as a music teacher. Um, but really what he wanted to do is he wanted to be, he wanted to be on his own. He wanted to do his own deal. So I think it's uh, great what Travis is, is teaching. And, and uh, you know, I, sw- I was, before we get jumped on this podcast, I was looking at uh, the, the motivation group, Mark, and there's someone in there saying, talking about this big deal that they had, and they're, they're going to be traveling uh, across the country beginning in June. And it's like, look, there's, there's somebody who's able to go do that before they have the kids and before they have the, I think they're married, but they don't have the kids yet. And so they're able to go do this and they're able to enjoy that life and have that experience that you and I, we, we kind of look at and we're like, man, we didn't get that experience. Yeah. I mean, and I think a lot of it is, um, you know, generational, right? Uh, I mean, Travis, a lot of your friends, the millennial generation is very experience based over, uh, stuff, right. Or, um, uh, you know, yeah. keeping up with the Joneses, like Scott, you and I, we, we were coming out, like we were competitive. You got to buy the, the house. For the sake of being competitive. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. We got, we bought houses, right? Like we, we went out and we had to buy the house and, uh, you know, the, it was keeping up with the Joneses. And today, like you said, Mark, the, the millennials, they're, they're not, they're about the experience. Hey, I, I don't want, I don't, it's almost like Tim Ferriss, you know, like in a way, Tim Ferriss, like uh, ruined the generation, if you will, because, you know, he basically said, Hey, you don't need all this money. In fact, you know, you can, you can go live in, you know, Mexico or somewhere else where it's the cheaper cost of living. And it's like, you know, living arbitrage, if you will. And, you know, so I think, uh, I think a whole group, a whole generations listened to this and said, we don't need to make X amount of money, you know, as long as I can, you know, have my basic necessities met and I can live, I'd rather be free than chained up to a corporate job. So, so Travis, your mom, I'm sure has an opinion about all this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, she loves it. She's, uh, I, she, I mean, what opinion about what specifically are you talking about? Like about, about you and your life and your startups and your commerce. I mean, there must've been some point where mom's like, Travis, don't quit your job. Right. Oh yeah. No, my mom and my dad, when I was first going to quit my job at the time, I was making as much money as my dad was. And you know, he was obviously 30 years older than I am. So I was, but once again, had a good corporate job. They both thought I was crazy since then, since they've seen this, they're both like, yeah, you made the right decision. And I think it's uh, for them. It's, it's a little bit, you know, it's their little kid. They're nervous that, Oh my God, what's going to happen. And I think something that people forget, and this is especially true for me and millennials in my generation is we have a huge safety net. In fact, I'd say most people in, in America, obviously things change once you have a kid. I, I, I want to say I understand that, but I do not by any means. But even then, it, there's such a huge safety net. What's the worst case scenario that happens to me? Well, I have to go live on mom and dad's couch. Or let's say for some reason, I don't have a good relationship with my family. There's so many programs put in place that you look at on the streets. I've, I've never met a homeless person that I, I go up to and they're like, yeah, I tried to start a company and it failed. It's always, it's like, oh, I have a drug alcohol problem or I'm, you know, crazy of, of some kind. So I, my parents were scared, of course, but since then my dad's like, man, I wish I would have done what you did. You know, and my, my mom says the same thing. 
I mean, in a way, and, and you know, Mark Grant Cardone said this to you. Uh, I, I heard it. Um, I heard it uh, in an audible book. But look, if you're gonna fail because of business, it's not gonna. It's not necessarily gonna hurt you because guess what? You have chapter eleven, chapter seven, right? Like it, it's a restart. Like you can just close up your business and say it didn't work. In fact, major companies have done it, <laughs> right? And they, they, they still get to run the, the, the company. So, you know, it's, I mean, I think we put too much emphasis on being scared of failure. Oh, well, what if I have to file bankruptcy? Yeah, you're gonna file business bankruptcy, you know? Yeah, I mean, it's never as bad as what you think it's going to be, mm-hmm. ever. I mean, even Kevin Kelly, who uh, talks about this is like, well, he always thought, well, I had a great time in Asia when he was a kid. I'd moved to Asia. I could live on pennies a day. He's like, and he had a child. He's like, you know, my, my kid doesn't need much. He likes playing with pots and pans in a box, right? They don't need many toys. It'd be an adventure. They could live on, you know, rice and beans and, and be happy. Because he remembers thinking, I, I was super happy doing that. Like, why couldn't, like, so he could just take these big risks. Uh, mindset is so critical. Um, to success. It, it's, it's crazy. I mean, I, I, I don't know, Travis, do you think mindset is more important than a good business idea? I think so. Yeah. Cause I mean, with the, the right mindset, uh, you can continue to kind of iterate. So you have a bad, bad business idea and you have a good mindset. Well, eventually you'll figure out a better business idea and a better business idea. And that's, I mean, something I've thought about kind of relating back to what we were also just talking about is I figure worst case scenario, I start a company. Uh, I actually, I, my gut or not my gut, my thought was P dance where fails. What's the big deal? It's a lesson. People always used to tell me four to five businesses fail. I'm like, cool. I'll start five. The fifth one statistics, it should succeed, but also it's how much is an MBA An MBA? I don't know, 200 grand. I don't know the exact numbers. I've learned way more starting a company in the last four years, uh, probably in the, even in the last first two years than I would in an MBA. And I'm, obviously I don't have an MBA, so I can't say that for sure. But when you're in it day in and day out and you're, the food on your table is dependent on whether or not you succeed, uh, you learn a lot. So mindset is very important because I think if you get stuck on the negatives constantly, you're going to fail because that's all you ever see. If you are stuck on the positives and can kind of constantly change directions, I think it's extremely important. So Travis, we're at that point now in the podcast where we're going to put you on the spot and ask you for your tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something actionable where the art of passive income listeners can go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? So for tip of the week, I would say take, a, take that small baby step. I'm sure this is not the first time you've heard it, but if, it's, if you have an idea for a website, buy the domain name. Type in 99 cent GoDaddy domains. You can get a domain name for 99 cents. If you already have the domain name, uh, go put up a website. Even if it's a crappy website, we were talking about before the podcast, the banner on bdancer.com. I put it up in, I don't know, I made it in like 30 minutes. It was just something crappy. We've done well over a million dollar revenue with that. So whatever that little tiny step is, just do that. Forget about all the details because nothing's ever going to be perfect. I love it. Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? Mark, you're going to love me for this tip. I already love you, Scott. How much more can I love you? You're you're going to love it. Okay. So one of my biggest pet peeves in the world is these robocalls. You know, like where they call, they're like, you answer the phone. It's like, hi, this is Karen calling you about your student loans. And I'm on the do not call list. It's like these people don't care about the do not call list. And then if you want to get off the do not call list, you have to press like one. And then you, know, you get a person on the line. You're like, hey, listen, I'm on the do not call list. Well, just hang up. Well, no, don't, don't call me. It's annoying. So I came across this app and I'm going to drop it to you right here. And it's called Haya, H-I-Y-A. H-I-Y-A. You use this thing? I have heard of it, H-I-Y-A. Okay. So basically what, what happens is all of the users come together and when they get one of these robocalls, they're like, boom, they report as a robocall. And as the community, the community starts policing these people. And then you can set up a setting on your phone through this app that says, hey, if, if it's a known scam or fraud or telemarketer or robocall that the community has judged, 
don't even send it to my phone. Just send it to voicemail. I was getting like, I don't know, five of these calls a day. I'm down to maybe one a day. Oh, wow. I, I yeah. just signed up. Yeah. 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 I love it. SM, SMS sent. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Well, my tip of the week is learn more about Travis and get some nut butter if you're uh, a CrossFit paleo, vegan. keto, super healthy, vegan, <laughs> you know, one of, one of those people like that's annoying. Like you go to like the ice cream store and they like, oh, I'll just have a salad, right? <laughs> Great so, salad at the ice cream store. <laughs> yeah. I just, you know, I'm good. You go have that sugar. I'll, uh, I'll have some green tea. Thank you. So is it, what's, is it performancenutbutter.com? performancenutbutter.com and it's uh-huh. it's macadamia coconut cashew blend that's all that's in there actually a little bit of himalayan sea salt as well it's it's super tasty it almost tastes like a dessert but it's not it's healthy for you so you know i'm hazing you but I, i'm i'm your customer for that actually so i'm i'm excited to get i don't know scott what do you think is a, a fair exchange for having travis on the podcast like a palette a palette i think a palette yeah yeah, so Trav, Travis is like, I'm sorry. I'm a trifle <laughs> deaf in my left ear. Yeah, yeah, I can't. You guys are breaking up. Yeah, yeah. So um, I'm, I'm really excited about the Kickstarter campaign. Travis, what you're doing is, is so inspirational. Um, I think your mentorship, this podcast has been phenomenal. So I, I just want to thank you. And um, just remind the listeners, the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like a Travis Mar- Marziani is if you do us three simple favors. You got to subscribe, you got to rate, and you got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of that review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free the $97 passive income launch kit. Uh, Travis, are we good? We're good. Scott, are we good? We're good, Mark. All right, we're doing this? Let's do it. All right, I'll, I'll go on your beat. One, two, three. Let, Let freedom, freedom ring. ring. I was following the hand on that. I don't know. I don't know. Travis is like, oh, if I knew this was going to be the end. He's out. Life. It's like, oh, man. I was, I was going to have you guys on my podcast, but now I'm, you know. Now I don't know anymore. Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, listeners. Again, this podcast is sponsored by postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.